In porn, the average man lasts 40 minutes and professional male performers over an hour. But here's what most people don't realize. That stopwatch is ticking down to a very modern form of erectile dysfunction before many even hit 30. We treat porn like fast food for the eyes. It's cheap, easy, everywhere. A little indulgent maybe, but basically harmless. But what if it isn't harmless at all? What if porn is behaving more like a drug? Hijacking reward systems, blunting motivation, and reshaping desire and intimacy at a fundamental level. Your brain on porn rewires the reward pathways the same way as drug addiction, lighting up those dopamine receptors until normal life feels dull by comparison. And that's just the beginning. Self-esteem takes a massive hit too, as people compare themselves to unrealistic standards. Medical researchers have found that frequent porn use can actually shrink areas of the brain associated with motivation and decision-making. This rewiring happens fast. And in some cases, just weeks of heavy use can change how your reward system responds. And so today, I want to show you exactly how this plays out in the clinic, in the brain, and in society. We'll look at what happens when the pursuit of novelty becomes a compulsion, how hypersexual disorder fits into the bigger picture, and most importantly, what we can do about it. I'm Dr. Sunil Rege, consultant psychiatrist, and educator. Let's start with the brain. Every new pornographic clip delivers a dopamine spike, lighting up the brain's reward circuitry. It targets the ventral tegmental area and dopamine floods the nucleus accumbens, the reward center. We're talking about spikes similar to those seen with cocaine and amphetamines. Initially, this creates excitement, but the brain responds by adjusting. To keep things balanced, it begins to prune dopamine receptors. The result, what we call desensitization, which means what used to turn you on just doesn't register. You need more novelty, more extreme content, faster switching. This is the textbook path of addiction. Sensitization to cues, desensitization to reward, and compulsivity despite harm. It isn't just psychological, it's neurobiological. Take a deep dive in this video here on the neuroscience of addiction. Therapists are seeing more and more young men who can't get aroused without the extreme stimulation porn provides. And we see it clinically too. Patients describe the inability to enjoy partner intimacy, losing hours online, and a growing dependence that doesn't feel like a choice. Porn addiction sits at this strange intersection of sex, tech, and mental health that we rarely talk about openly. It's literally reshaping human sexuality in real time with unlimited access to content previous generations couldn't even imagine. The industry keeps evolving while our understanding of its impacts struggles to keep up. So where does psychiatry fit in? We have two key conditions, one hypersexual disorder and two problematic online porn use, popu. Hypersexual disorder is a term used when this behavior becomes excessive and disruptive. It includes compulsive masturbation, cyber sex, strip club visits, and excessive sex with consenting adults. Its prevalence? Estimates range between three to 6%, but it's likely underdiagnosed. Why? Because it's hidden, wrapped in shame, or dismissed as a lifestyle choice. But the consequences are real. Shame, depression, social dysfunction, and relationship breakdowns. Now layer on top what we call popu, problematic online pornography use. That's where things really escalate. It's absent from DSM-5, but ICD-11 now recognizes compulsive sexual behavior disorder, CSBD. So what does this clinically look like? A 25 year old medical student spending eight hours daily toggling tabs, fails finals, can't climax with a partner. Diagnosis, popu, and a depressive episode. And treatment here, can be life-saving. So let's ask ourselves, what makes online porn so addictive? The AAA engine. Accessibility, affordability, anonymity. Accessibility, the smartphones put an adult video store in every pocket. Affordability, ad-driven sites monetize eyeballs, not subscriptions. Anonymity, incognito tabs erase evidence, shame stays hidden. TikTok scroll culture primes short attention loops. Porn algorithms upsell novelty. The same mechanics that fuel e-commerce addictions now target 
libido. This is not like borrowing a magazine under your brother's bed. This is algorithm-driven, infinite novelty tailored to you. Every click is data. Every scroll, a reinforcement. And that's how it spirals. Now, here's a shocking fact. Did you know the average age that kids first see porn is now just 11 years old? Surveys show 90% of boys and 60% of girls view explicit content by 18. The gap between first porn and first real life kiss can be a decade. Early exposure entwines arousal with non-relational stimuli, increasing risk for low desire, erectile dysfunction, and relational anxiety. Because when fantasy becomes the teacher, reality is going to flunk the exam. With porn available 24 seven on every device, addiction rates are climbing, while relationship satisfaction is dropping. So what's actually happening in the brain? In people with compulsive porn use, there is sensitization, hypersensitivity to cues, thumbnails, notification. Desensitization, reduced pleasure from everyday intimacy. Third, hypofrontality, weakened prefrontal control, leading to impulsivity. This mirrors substance addiction in almost every way. Yet, because this is just behavior, many don't take it seriously until they feel completely out of control. But there is hope. Neuroplasticity cuts both ways. Brains can change in both directions. So let's talk treatment principles. First, the psychological principles. Cognitive behavioral therapy. CBT can target maladaptive beliefs such as I can't sleep without porn. Techniques include stimulus control, urge surfing, relapse prevention plans. Two, we have acceptance commitment therapy. This teaches willingness to tolerate urges while aligning with values. Third, mindfulness-based relapse prevention. This increases prefrontal activation and reduces cue reactivity. Fourth, group therapy and 12-step programs. These can provide accountability and reduce shame. Fifth, digital self-help and online modules. Scalable, but adherence to this remains the Achilles heel. Next, we come to pharmacological interventions. One, we have opioid antagonists such as naltrexone and nalmethine. These reduce the reward of orgasm. So there is a case study where 18 milligrams of nalmethine led to long-term remission in a single case study. Naltrexone is used in a range of addictions. Essentially, we're trying to break the relationship between the cue and the behavior. Two SSRIs. This can be useful in patients with OCD traits or comorbid anxiety. Side effects sometimes are used as a clinical tool because SSRIs can reduce libido and can result in sexual dysfunction. This is of course an ethical dilemma requiring more intense discussion with the medical professional. Third, bupropion. Bupropion may improve motivation without worsening libido. And fourth, there are other medications such as topiramate that can enhance impulse control. But remember, medication alone is like muting the fire alarm while the fire still burns. Third, there is emerging technology such as repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex stimulation reduces cravings. We have transcranial direct current stimulation and neurofeedback. Experimental, but promising. And finally, there are blended and future models which include combined CBT and medications which outperform monotherapy. There's digital phenotyping and AI-driven recovery apps on the horizon. So let me summarize all of this for you. We've seen how porn hijacks the reward system, how compulsive use rewires the brain, how hypersexual disorder and popu disrupt intimacy, motivation, and function. But we've also seen what works from therapy to medication. So what did we learn? One, dopamine hijack. Novelty floods reward circuits, dulling real life. Two, hypersexual disorder and popple, hidden but clinically devastating. Three, the triple A engine. Accessibility, affordability, anonymity, turbocharge compulsion. And fourth, the great sexual experiment. Early exposure, relationship fallout, rising erectile dysfunction. Fifth, brain changes, sensitization, desensitization, and hypofrontality, mirrors drug addiction. And sixth, treatment and hope, CBT, mindfulness, group work, plus medications like naltrexone, nalmethine, and cutting edge RTMS. Remember, neuroplasticity 
goes both ways. The same brain that learns compulsion can relearn connection. If this video resonated, share it because silence fuels stigma. Give it a like, let the algorithm know that this video matters. Clinicians craving deeper dives, check out the Academy by Psych scene, where we've got modules on the neuroscience of addiction and treatment. I'm Dr. Rege and see you in the next video where we'll unpack a step-by-step -step clinical protocol for breaking the cycle and rebuilding intimacy when it comes to meth and sex. Until then, stay curious. Bye.